Um, yes, there it is. Those of you who like, you can join me. Om Bhadram Karne Bhe Shrinuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Stushtuvagam Sastanubhihi Vyashema Deva Hitain Yadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridhashravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swasti Nastarkshyo Arishtanemihi Swasti Nobri Haspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 And we are back. The Mandukya Upanishad, in common with all the other Upanishads, presents an inquiry into the self. Who am I or what am I? Yes. Thank you. Who am I or what am I? Why should we do this inquiry into the self? After all, ourselves, who knows me better than myself? I know myself. What is there to learn? Here I am. And what good does it do to learn this? So Vedanta, which is the philosophy of the Upanishads, says that we do not know ourselves. Swami Vivekananda, when he came here more than a hundred years ago um, to, to the West in the United States, he would sometimes say, if only you knew yourselves as you truly are. And that's the solution to all our problems. In fact, the end of all spiritual practice, devotion and knowledge and service and meditation, yoga, Vedanta, Bhakti, all of that is ultimately this knowing what we truly are, already are. So this self-inquiry, each Upanishad presents it in its own unique way. And in the Mandukya Upanishad, the shortest and the most powerful of the Upanishads, it is presented as an inquiry into the self, into the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep states. We read last time, this self has four aspects. Remember, all the time, what we are talking about is av available to us immediately. I mentioned yesterday that sometimes in religion or spirituality we talk about something that has to be taken on faith. God, heaven, on faith. Or sometimes we talk about things which are meant to be experienced but only after a long period of practice ultimately. We don't have it now but we will get that experience. But in Vedanta, the amazing thing is we are talking about something all the time present and it's just being pointed out to us. So the self has four aspects. Three of them are very well known to us. The three are waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. And by examining these three well-known aspects of the self, we are going to discover what the Upanishad really wants to tell us. The Upanishad really is not interested in our waking, dreaming, deep sleep. The Upanishad does not really start until the seventh mantra. What is going to be done now is just pointing out what we already know just drawing our attention to it, what we, it's already there for us. Everybody knows this. And then inquiring into it to reveal a fourth aspect which we do not know. That's what the Upanishad really wants to tell us. That will come later. An example which I found very uh, useful, I often used it, is the example of gold ornaments. So suppose there are these ornaments, three ornaments, maybe a necklace and a tiara and a bracelet. And uh, somebody comes and tells you that these ornaments, the reality is not these ornaments. The reality is something called gold. There's something real here which is called gold. And if I do not know what gold means, I might think, oh, there is a fourth. Apart from the necklace, the tiara and the bracelet, there is a fourth called gold. Let me throw away these ornaments and look for the gold. Will I find it? No. Because the gold is right there in and through those ornaments. Those ornaments themselves are made of gold. They are gold themselves. One mistake is to mistake the ornament itself for gold. Oh, so the necklace is gold means this thing which looks like this and you put it on your neck and you call it a necklace. This is gold. No, 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 no. If you melt it and make it into a bracelet, then the necklace form is gone. 
the necklace used, that you put it on your neck, that's gone. Even the word necklace is gone. You can't use it for a bracelet. A new word has come, bracelet. A new form has come, like this. New use has come, you put it here. New name, new use, new form. Nama Rupa Vyavahara in Sanskrit, changed. But the reality, that substance, the material, same. Same gold was melted from a necklace and made into a bracelet. The gold continues. The one who has understood what gold is will say, oh, it's the same thing. The same material is still there. The one who does not understand, who thought necklace was gold, will say, gold is gone. Gold is not there anymore. So, the reality gold is something which underlies the ornaments. It's not a new kind of ornament. Gold is not a fourth kind of ornament, new type of ornament. No, no. Necklace is an ornament. Bracelet is an ornament. A tiara is an ornament. Jewel. Ornament. But gold is not a new kind of ornament. Gold is the reality of these ornaments. It's actually a very beautiful example. Um, notice one thing about it. So uh, let me relate it to what we are going to do. Our reality is not the waker or the waker's world. Our reality is not the dreamer and the dream world. It is not even the deep sleeper and the deep sleep blankness. But the consciousness which l runs through all of them and underlies all of them to whom all these appear and disappear. Just like gold and the ornaments. Like necklace, tiara and bracelet, we have waking here, dreaming and deep sleep. And like the gold, in and through, underlying it all, we have this consciousness. That's what we're going to be talked about, that fourth consciousness, that will come later. Notice how this example is so interesting. Gold is not stuck to any of these ornaments. You see? The gold can be a necklace, it can happily be a bracelet, it can happily be a tiara or something else. Not stuck. It's not clinging to any of these ornaments. You can melt it and make it into something else. But these ornaments depend totally on gold. Without the necklace, the gold can be a, a, a bracelet or a tiara. But without gold, the necklace cannot exist. The tiara cannot exist. The bracelet cannot exist. I hope you are with me. It's a very common sense example I'm giving. Similarly, consciousness is not stuck to any of these states. You, the consciousness, you are not stuck to this body. You are not stuck to this mind, even these thoughts. Uh, imagine, the body has changed so much from babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to old age. The body changes so much. Same awareness experiences all of these changes. The mind changes even more. How much the mind changes in one day from early morning till, till now. How many times sleepy and alert and bored and excited and irritated and happy and hungry and satisfied. All of these in one day from now till now, from the morning till now. How much the mind changes. Imagine the mind we had when we were little children. What we thought of, what we liked, what we wanted. And then when we were teenagers maybe. What we thought of, what we liked, what we wanted, what we knew. And then we grew up, grew up further. How the mind changes, our knowledge, our likes and dislikes and projects and dreams and angers and disappointments, all of them come and go to the same consciousness which you are. So that consciousness is not stuck to the body or mind. The consciousness is not stuck to waking, dreaming or deep sleep. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep come and go to the same consciousness. So the gold and ornaments is a very good example. One more. Gold is the is that from which the ornaments emerge and disappear. Similarly, consciousness is that from which the states of waking, dreaming, and dis, uh, deep sleep emerge and disappear. The ornaments are not real apart from the gold. Take the gold away from the ornament, it will disappear. It has no existence of its own. Similarly, the claim is this entire waking state and this waking person, they have, it has no existence apart from the underlying consciousness. The entire dream state and the dreamer, no existence from the underlying consciousness. 
and the deep sleep blankness. No existence apart from the underlying consciousness. So these are different ways you can relate the, uh, the gold and ornaments example to um, consciousness and waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Before we go on, I, just, I was just reminded right now of a story I thought I'd, I'd share with you by seeing the picture of Swami Shivanandaji, which is right there at the back. This goes back many, many decades to the uh, middle of the 20th century. Many of you may have heard of Swami Chinmayanandaji, who founded the Chinmay Mission. He was also a disciple of Swami Shivanandaji of the Divine Life Society. He was, Chinmayanandaji in his earlier life was an investigative journalist. So he had gone to the Himalayas to expose the monks there to write an investigative article about the Swamis in the, in the Himalayas. And he became a Swami himself. <laughs> so he was very impressed by Swami Shivanandaji. But he had uh, a desire. He said, can I learn Vedanta in the traditional way from a traditional Himalayan master? Can you direct me? So Swami Shivananda thought, and then he was acquainted with a number of great teachers in the Himalayas in those days. And so he selected one, who was um, Tapovan Swami, who lived in the Himalayas, spent most of his life there, great master, long before my time. But I have gone to the hut where he used to live. Um, so this Swami was a great teacher of Advaita Vedanta, but a very traditional teacher. So the lowest he would come down physically also is Uttarkashi, which is 5,000 feet. So in winter, he would come down to that, no lower than that. And then when the snows melted, he would go up to Gango 3, which is 10,000 feet, or Tapo 1, which is 14,000 feet, and so on. And he lived the, most of his life there. After he went to the Himalayas, he never really came back. Enlightened, knower of Brahman, enlightened being. So Swami Chinmayananda was sent to him to study Vedanta traditionally. And traditionally means um, he would accept only those who were monks as disciples, brahmacharis or sannyasis as disciples. And you would have to go there and beg for your food. And there were very little places to beg for, very, very meager food. You are to take care of your own food and your own residence. Residence means either a hut or a cave. And uh, none of it heated. So if it is... Uh, um, 10 degrees Celsius outside is also 10 degrees and your bed is also 10 degrees Celsius or, or at zero degrees, whatever it is. And there would be two classes in the day with Tapo and Swami. And you would have to go and the classes were uh, of the Upanishads. And uh, uh, whatever was taught in one class, you would have to repeat back verbatim in the next class. If you failed, you're banished forever from the class. <laughs> So that was the kind of uh, traditional training which Swami Chinmayananda had to look, up to look forward to. Anyhow, the story concerns one particular part of it. As you can guess, he had very few students. Not like this. <laughs> I met his attendant. I think he's still living, Swami Sundarananda, who, who uh, lives in Gangotri, in the same hut where his master Swami Tapovan lived, and where Swami Chinmayananda came to study. Sundarananda also told me the stories of how the first day Swami Chinmananda came to study and he escorted Chinmananda ji to uh, Tapovan uh, Maharaj. I think at that time Swami Chinmananda was a brahmachari probably. Uh, so, but it concerns one particular aspect. At that time they were studying the Mandukya Karika, this text. And Swami Chinmananda ji had a question. If there is pure consciousness and I am that, and that alone is real, Brahman alone is real, that, that ultimate fourth, that is real. Then why the other three? Why, are, why is anything there at all? Why does this appear? Why does the world, I'm sure, oh, all right, let it be an appearance, let it be maya, illusion, whatever it is. But why does it appear at all? What is the necessity? Why is there a waking? Why is there a dreaming? Why is there a deep sleep? Why couldn't there be just pure consciousness? Because that's the only reality. So that's the question. What is the necessity of all of this? What good does it do? It just seems to create trouble. We feel we are trapped in samsara, then we have to learn Vedanta and all of that, and then become enlightened. Why go through all of that? Why all of this anyway? So he had asked this question, and Tapovan Swami did not reply. Next day in the class, suddenly in the middle of the class, Tapovan Swami asked the, the students, Chinman and Diji, to get me a glass of water. No, oh, he said, get me some water. I want to drink water. Get me some water. 
And uh, Chin Manonji was surprised because usually that did not happen in the middle of the class. And there you have to get water from the Ganga, the river flowing. It's, it's very narrow and fast there, but very clear water in some seasons. I mean, rainy seasons, it's very muddy. <laughs> so he goes down and uh, he takes this brass glass made of brass and he takes some water from the river and climbs back up again. I've seen the place where they used to study. So he climbs back up again and brings it here to his master. And suddenly Tapavan Swami is fierce and angry. What have you done? I got you what you asked for. What did I ask for? I said, um, glass of water. Glass of water? You asked for water. Yes. And what did you get? A glass of water. Why a glass of water? I didn't ask for a glass. I asked for water. And Chinmanji says, I stood there stunned for a moment. Here was the answer to my question. Here is the answer to the question, why is there any of this manifestation at all? See, you cannot get water without the glass. To make the water useful, to get it, you need a container. Otherwise, you can't get it. What is necessary is the water. But for that, to make it useful and to get it, you need a container. Similarly, Vedanta says, the only way to experience yourself, the only way Brahman can experience itself, pure consciousness can experience itself, is through manifestation, through names and forms. So it's a very profound answer. Why does pure consciousness manifest itself in all these ways? Because this is the only way it experiences itself. As pure consciousness, there's no question of subject-object experience. In, a, in another form, this beautiful story which I like very much, um, there was a wonderful humorous teacher of Vedanta and Zen in the 1950s and 60s, Alan Watts in San Francisco. I never met him long before my time, but his books are very nice. Um, one of his books, easily remembered, it's called The Book. So you can easily remember. <laughs> you can Google it up. At one, one time, it was very um, popular. It's a small book, but worth reading. It's called The Book, The Taboo Against Knowing Who We Are. A taboo Against Knowing Who We Are. So there, he starts off with an, ex uh, with an answer to this question. Why does that fourth, pure consciousness, manifest itself at all? So it's a children's story, but I think it's really instructive. I mean, it's very beautiful. We learn so much from that little children's story. He says, in the beginning, there was nothing at all. God alone existed. From eternity to eternity, God alone existed. But existing alone can get to be a bore very fast. So God got bored, just existing. So God thought God would play, but whom can he play with? There is, he has no friends, there's nobody else. So poor God thought about it. And because he was God, he was, he's awfully clever because he's God, he hit upon a plan. Whom can he play with? He needs a friend. So God pretended to be not God. Now there are two, God and God pretending to be not God. And now God could play. But a problem came up. Because God is God, and he is awfully good at what he does, when he pretended to be not God, he truly completely forgot that he was God. And now God pretending to be not God and totally forgotten his own God nature is now looking for God. And this is samsara. Here we all are. <laughs> That's a nice story. But it's really an answer to this question. Why is the fourth appearing in all these forms? The fourth pure consciousness appearing as us, you and him and her and me, and we've totally forgotten what we are, and we're trying to find out what we are. So Vedanta says, start with what we know, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And that's what we're going to start with. Verses, the mantras, mantras three, four, five, and six deal with waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Let's take a look. Mantra number three. Yes. You can repeat after me if you like. Jagarita sthano, Jagarita sthano, Bahish pragyaham, Bahish pragyaham, Saptangam, Ekonavingshati mukhaham, 
एकोनविंशति मुखः स्थूलभुग वैश्वानरः स्थूलभुग वैश्वानरः प्रथमः पादः प्रथमः पादः द सेल्फ आत्मन हैज फोर एस्पेक्ट्स द फर्स्ट एस्पेक्ट इज Vaishwanara, whose sphere of activity is the waking state, who is conscious of external objects, who has seven limbs and nineteen mouths, and whose experience consists of gross or material objects. See, so what's all this? It's talking about you. Right now, I don't have nineteen mouths. Yes, you do. We'll take a look now. As we go into this. remember it's just it may sound strange but it's actually a discussion of exactly what we experience our waking dreaming and deep sleep to be we'll take a look at these and then penetrate deeper so first how does the upanishad describe the waking state in the waking state that atman that consciousness has got a special name vishwa vishwa this name is not given in the mantra itself but later on gaurapada will add it in the karika vishwa so your name his name her name this is a common generic name vishwa what is vishwa consciousness limited by the mind and the body in the waking state as we are exactly now upanishad calls us vishwa but as we go we'll find there are two things to keep track of one is us individually and there is a cosmic aspect look here you are an individual being with a body and a mind but look around you there are hundreds thousands millions and billions of other human beings and living uh, animals and plants and you know from dolphins and whales to tigers and lions to bacteria all kinds of living beings and non living world material world all of this is called the cosmic now when the upanishad will go through waking dreaming and deep sleep what the upanishad will do is it will describe two things one is you or i the individual and the cosmic so the individual and the cosmic in sanskrit vyashti and samashti vyashti means individual and cosmic means samashti this cosmic is the vedantic idea of god you see we come across the idea of god in all the theistic religions of the world but there is no precise definition or clarity about it you will see now vedanta has a very precise understanding of what god is very clear understanding just as you or i we have these three states waking dreaming and deep sleep a gross a subtle and a causal state an outer intermediate innermost state similarly god too has all these three a physical being the entire universe just as this body is my body i the vishwa here i have this body god has this universe as this body as i have a mind thoughts feelings emotions ideas god too has the mind the cosmic mind all our minds put together think of an incredible uh, mental internet you know <laughs> like a world wide web so all our minds connected together imagine if that's so what will it be like a cosmic mind and as we imagine a potential state a deep sleep state like a hibernation deep sleep god too has that causal state that is called consciousness plus maya and so these ones we will see at each stage waking dreaming deep sleep there will be a description of the individual there will be a description of the cosmic description of the individual applies to you or me and description of the cosmic applies to god the totality at this point someone we object swami you promised nothing of what is going to be said is a matter of faith it's all what we know yes i uh, made a little exception there when you talk, when the when you talk about the cosmic that you exist and i exist we can see i know fr- from my internal experience that i am awareness plus there is a mind and a body and you know that same from your internal exist uh, experience but how do we know that there is a cosmic person and consciousness associated with everything what is being called god how do we know that that you have to take on faith now remember it does not do any harm to the actual teaching of the upanishad whether you believe in that or not but it's rather cool the way it's, it's described <laughs> um so we have the individual and the cosmic let's see what it means step by step jagarita sthano the waking state it is characterized by bahish pragya and externalized awareness 
we are contacting the world through our senses in the waking state. This is how it defines the waking state. Imagine a man who in the morning opens the doors and windows of his house and conducts business buying and selling with the world outside. After some time, he puts, pulls down the shutters, goes to his living room and watches a TV program maybe. And after some time, he goes to his bedroom and sleeps. So when he's interacting with the shutters open with the world outside, that can be like the waking state. And when he's withdrawn inside, shut the, uh, the windows and doors, the shutters, pull down the shutters, and watching a TV, it's like the dream state. Withdrawn inside and watching a movie. And then when he goes to the bedroom and sleeps, that's deep sleep state. Similarly, in the waking state here, it is said, our attention is externalized. We are aware of an external world. And what else? Saptanga, seven limbs. I will come back to that. Ekonavingshati Mukhaha, 19 mouths. What are the 19 mouths? The five sense organs. The five sense organs. Uh, eyes, by which we see, ears to hear, and nose to smell, tongue to taste, and the skin to touch. The five sense organs are five mouths. The five motor organs are also called five mouths in the sense it interacts with the world outside. The five organs of action, karmendriya. What are they? The um, tongue to speak, or so the same tongue which tastes also speaks. So the, the uh, organ of speech, the uh, organs of grasping, hands, the organs of uh, locomotion, walking, feet, and the or organ of reproduction and evacuation. Five organs, the organs of action. Ten, we have got ten so far, ten mouths. Five plus five. Then the pancha prana, the five vital forces, which is very important in yoga. Uh, prana, apana, vyana, udana, samana. There are five vital forces which have their respective functions. Now we are up to 15. Five sense organs, five organs of action, five pranas, 15. Now the internal organ, what we generically call the mind, has four functions. The mind itself, and there's a specific definition of what the mind is. Sankalpa vikalpatmakam manaha. Mind is that which considers all kinds of alternatives, the seat of emotions. Intellect, which understands the ability to uh, comprehend something. That's also a function of the mind. Then the chitta, the storehouse of our memories and vasanas, the tendencies accumulated. That's also a function of the mind, what you might call the subconscious mind. And finally, the ego, ahankara, the fourth function of the mind. That's also a function of the mind. We are not the ego, the one which keeps on saying, I, I, I. That's a cognition in the mind. It comes and goes. It's not you. It, it's not me. Consciousness and ego are different. Ego is the unifying function of the mind. When the eyes see, I says, I see. Eyes, I, the vertical eye. I see, I hear, I smell, or I taste, or I touch, I walk and talk, I think, I remember, I want, I love, I hate, I, 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 I understand, or I do not understand, I, I, I. All the other things are functions of the different parts of the body-mind, but the I is something that appropriates all these functions. So that's one, one part of the mind. Now we have 19 mouths. Five sense organs, five organs of action, five pranas, and the uh, mana, buddhi, chitta, hankara, the four functions of the mind. Nineteen mouths. Um, and with these mouths, what do we eat? Stula bhuk. We experience the gross objects of the material world. Here it means sight, forms, sound, smells, taste, touch. These are the things which we experience from the world outside. Now, the word here used here is Vaishwanaraha. Vaishwanara refers to the cosmic aspect. Remember two aspects, us the individual and the cosmic aspect, God with the entire universe as God's body, the physical body, let us say, of God. Imagine a consciousness associated with all our minds and all our bodies, not only what is there now. Remember, all beings who existed in the past all beings who exist now and all beings who will exist in the future, all of it together united into one 
tremendous cosmic being. That is this Vaishwanara. There are different names for it. Here the name is Vaishwanara. Another name is Virat. Literally means the vast. Another name we come across is in, in the Bhagavad Gita, 11th chapter, Vishwarupa, the world, the cosmic form. Somebody yesterday was asking, isn't the 11th chapter um, what Arjuna saw? He asked Krishna, can I see your... I believe you that you are an avatar of God. You are saying that I believe you. But can I actually experience your cosmic form? Because right now you look like a human being. But can I experience you in your cosmic form? And by the grace of God, Arjuna had that experience for all the good that it did him. He, got, he was absolutely scared, terrified. He, what did he see? In the 11th chapter of the Gita, you get a tremendous description. Some of the most grand poetry that we have, you can imagine. As if a thousand suns rise in the sky together. Imagine the, the brightness, the blazing radiance of that. A thousand suns rising in the sky. When the first atom bomb exploded, um, the great scientist, Oppenheimer, he was a Sanskrit scholar too. He quoted from the Bhagavad Gita when he saw the, the unearthly radiance of that atomic explosion. He said, I come time the destroyer of worlds with the radiance of a thousand, thousand suns. Grand description. What did Arjuna see actually and what scared him? Imagine, imagine. You know, one of the things which is scary is public speaking. So why we get nervous when you're in front of everybody. One um, anthropologist said, see it's an, an animal reaction. When you stare at a dog or a cat, it look like that. The dog or the cat will look back at you. And after some time, it's an, if it's an aggressive dog, it'll bark at you or it'll try to bite you. Or if it's more timid, it'll just walk away or run away from you. Fight or flight. Staring is a sign of aggression in the animal world. If, normally, you see when two people are speaking, they will sp look at each other and look away, look here and there, again look at each other. But if you're constantly looking, your boss is angry at you, constantly looking at you. So that's a sign of aggression. Or your mom gets mad at you, constantly you know you're in trouble. Imagine in public speaking, you're sitting and 200 people are constantly looking at you. <laughs> now, they're not mad at you. They just want to listen to what you say. But the animal part of the brain reacts. So this is what social psychologists say. Why, there is, why is this stage fright? Why do people get scared in front of an audience? So 200 people looking at you. The biggest audience I ever was, uh, saw was in India, in one place. 13,000 people, 13, 14,000 people. So a huge audience. When they're staring, that was also not the most scary audience I've faced. The most scariest audience I've faced was a gathering of the monks of our order. As a young monk asked to say something two or three minutes, and here you have about 600 monks, all senior to you, all looking at you like this. <laughs> so <laughs> Now imagine Arjuna's condition. Imagine all, not 100 people, 600 people, or 13,000 people. Imagine 7 billion people in this world. And all the living creatures, from a little cat to a, 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 a killer whale, or all kinds of creatures in this world, all of them together. And if there are demons in hells and gods in heavens, all of them together in one being. And suddenly that being turns and looks at you. Just the thought of it. Arjuna says, every hair in my body is standing on its end. Uh -huh. The earth shakes when you, when you walk. It, it talks to uh, Krishna in that form. So that's the Vaishwanara, the, the Virat. Ourselves, but magnified billions of times. You say, that's all very nice. Sounds like a superhero tale or something like that. Why should I believe it? You don't have to believe it. Don't worry. Because Mandukya Upanishad is not about that also. It is just the cosmic in the waking state. Uh, Mandukya is something deeper. The connection is like this. Imagine the ocean out there. Thousands of waves. Each of us is like a wave in this ocean of the universe. The entire ocean is like God, Virat or Vaishwanara. But what Mandukya is talking about is neither the wave nor the ocean. It's talking about something deeper and more powerful than both. Water itself. 
Why is water greater than ocean or wave? Because neither waves nor ocean can exist without the water. It is the water alone which appears as the wave and the ocean. The wave and the ocean both depend on the water for its existence. So, Vaishwanara. Now, it, this, I'll come back to what I'd left. Saptanga, seven limbs. So, the seven limbs is a description. See, the ancient uh, rishis of the Upanishads tried to conceive of this cosmic person. Can you think of this enormous universe as a being? So, they made an effort. That is the seven limbs. What is the seven limbs? This Vaishwanara or Virat, the cosmic person, God's physical body's appearance, has seven limbs. What are the seven limbs? The head is heaven. The heavens are the head. And uh, the um, wind is the breath. The eyes are the sun. And the mouth is fire. And the middle portion of the body is the sky. And the oceans are the bladder. And the earth is the feet of this cosmic person. So it's, it's an imagination. It's a, trying, trying to capture the idea of a cosmic being, the entire universe, as a person. Seven limbs, head, the heavens, breath, the wind, eye, the sun, mouth, fire. Mouth is fire. And then uh, the middle part of the body is the sky, and the bladder is the ocean, and the feet are the earth. So these are the seven limbs. The description you find in the Chandogya Upanishad. So it's borrowed from there. Saptanga. So in this uh, description, you find the waking state from our perspective and from the cosmic perspective. What's the point? No point at all. Just drawing your attention to what is known to all of us, this waking state. Keep it in mind. Now we go to the next one, the dream state. All they're trying to do is to show us the gold. It's, they're telling us, look at the necklace. Okay. Now look at the tiara. Okay, now look at the bracelet. All right, what's common? That's what they're trying to do. Now let's uh, go to mantra number four. If you like, you can uh, repeat after me. Swapnasthano, Swapnasthano, Antapragya, Saptanga. Eko na vingshati mukhaha, eko na vingshati mukhaha, pravivikta bhok, pravivikta bhok, taijaso, dvitiya padaha, dvitiya padaha. Second the second aspect is the dream state. When we fall asleep, we dream. And in the dream state, the same consciousness, which was called Vishwa in the waking state, is now given a new name, taijasa. Congratulations, you have a new name now. When you dream, that consciousness which you are is now called Taijasa. Literally, Taijasa means the fiery one. So, in dream, what happens? We have seven limbs, 19 mouths. I will not go through the list, list again, it's tedious. What, what it all means is that the physical world we, we lose sight of. We have, we have lost contact with the world. We have shut, pulled down the shutters. Our senses are shut down. Our body is sleeping. Only the mind is active. But in our dreams also, we have a body. And we see people with other bodies. And there is a world, a world of dreams, which we realize to be a dream only when we wake up. But, in, but during the dream, it seems to be pretty real. There also we have a body. And they are also all constructed by the mind. In the dream, there is actually no, there are no bodies and roads and cars and uh, worlds. Nothing is there. It's just constructed by the mind. That body in the dream constructed by the mind also has the same 19 mouths. And that cosmic person in the dream also has the seven limbs which we talked about. What it simply means is the dream world in many ways is a shadow, a replica of our waking world. Very naturally because it's constructed out of the impressions of our waking world. Swapnasthanaha. The dream state. There our name is, there our attention is drawn inwards. Antapragya. Antapragya means drawn inwards into the mind. Inwards into the mind. Not outwards to the senses into the world. Inwards into the mind. With the seven limbs, 19 mouths, what do we enjoy there? 
what did we enjoy what did we eat in the waking state form and smell and taste and sound the the, the gross material universe here pravivikta bhuk the internal objects whatever we experience in the dream world is also generated by the mind it's the mind which generates if you eat something you are not eating food in the dream world it's a it's a imagination of the mind if you meet people and talk to them and see things and hear music it's all generated by the mind it feels very real when when we are there so pravivikta bhuk we enjoy objects internal objects objects generated by the mind in the dream state when we talk about this inevitably in the class there'll be one or more people who will start talking about their dreams i dreamt this what is the meaning of this i dreamt that i saw this in the dream so what does the upanishad say about it let me tell you it may shock you the upanishad vedanta is not interested in your dreams <laughs> it's interested in you the consciousness to whom the dreams appear it's not interested in the contents of the dreams if you're interested in the contents of the dreams you want to know more about them your therapist is there he's willing to listen for a price he's willing to listen to all your dreams but vedanta is not interested the, i'm saying this i'm adapting it from a very interesting little anecdote of somebody who went to a swami in in the himalayas and was telling the swami about his sorrows i have this problem i have that problem and the swami very as if cruel and abruptly said to this person i'm not interested in your problems how cruel i'm not interested in your problems i'm interested in you thereby opening up a gap between me and my problems i am not defined by my problems you are not defined by your problems notice something none of our problems stick to us very great fact we we miss we this simple fact can free us from 90% of our sorrows think of the worst sorrows we have a human being can have how long does a person think of the loss or the pain or suffering 24 hours a day no a time must come when the person will fall asleep and it's all gone even when you are awake at that time do you think about the problems all the time no there will be there bound to be breaks was this problem there all throughout your life no there was a time when the problem was not there and there will be a time inevitably when the problem will not be there no problem lasts throughout our lifetime no problem lasts throughout our day even it's not experienced throughout the day no problem is carried over into deep sleep it may be carried over into dreams you may have nightmares about something but in deep sleep no problem nothing sticks to you your super teflon and material nothing <laughs> pure consciousness nothing sticks to you everything that changes must come and go one swami uh, in um, this is a place called swargashram near, near rishikesh so this is this swami he passed away a few years ago ram sukh das ji he was a wonderful swami he passed away at the age of 104 but he had wonderful insights um uh, he said between you the unchanging consciousness and the world which is changing there can be no relationship between the moving and the unmoving there can be no relationship what does he mean just imagine something is running around if you catch hold of it try to establish a relationship with it either you will be pulled along or that will stop something is moving and you are not moving you cannot hold on to it you cannot have a relationship with it the world is continuously changing the body is continuously changing the mind is continuously changing if we are this fourth pure consciousness unchanging we cannot have any relationship with this movie after movie can be played on the screen and the movie depends on the screen you cannot play a movie without the screen but the screen has no relationship with the movie the greatest stuff you know like a fire storm may come out in the movie the screen will not be burnt a great deluge storm may come in the in the movie the screen will not become even a little bit wet shankaracharya says the greatest of tragedies in the world do not touch you the atman you will live in it because of you they exist all the dramas of the world are played out on the stage which you are but you are not affected by it 
you survive even the greatest of crises. It's a fact. You may not believe it right now. The time will come. I'm not being morbid. The time will come one day when we will, this all will still be there and there'll be other groups of yogis. We'll be gone. But at that time, you will, when the body goes, you will say, one thing is true. The Swami was right. I'm still here. The body is gone. <laughs> he was right. It doesn't touch me. Uh, so, this, uh, in the dream state, we experience objects which are generated by the mind. And this is the second uh, aspect of the self. Here too, there are two. Individual and cosmic. Individuals, we are called taijasa, each of us. And imagine a dream state in which all the minds are linked together. You know, God is dreaming, let's say. All our minds together, a cosmic mind. The name for that is Hiranyagarbha. We come across it again and again in Vedanta. Consciousness plus cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha. Consciousness plus one mind, your mind or my mind, Taijasa. So this is the second state. And let's do the third one and the final one, deep sleep. You might think deep sleep is uninteresting. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Huh? But according to Vedanta, deep sleep is most interesting. So the Upanishad gives two mantras for deep sleep. One mantra for waking, one for dreaming, and one, two mantras for deep sleep. Fifth and sixth. Let's read through it. Yatra supto na kanchana kamam kamayate. Yatra supto na kanchana kamam kamayate. Na kanchana swapnam pashyati. Na kanchana swapnam pashyati. Tat sushuptam. Shuptam. Sushupta sthana. Shupta sthana. Eki bhutaha. Eki bhutaha. Pragyana ghana. Pragyana ghana. Evananda mayo. Yananda bhuk. Yananda bhuk. Cheto mukaha. Cheto mukaha. Pragya stritiya padaha. Pragya stritiya padaha. Let me just read, explain this one. Defines deep sleep. What is deep sleep? A negative definition. Yatra supno supto na kanchana kamam kamayate na kanchana swapnam pashyati. Where in deep sleep, that consciousness does not desire anything. Here it refers to wanting things of the world through the sense organs. That means not it's not awake. It's not experiencing anything in the world. The through sense organs. Na kanchana swapnam pashyati. Neither does it dream. So no dreams are also seen. In deep sleep, the body is not active, the sense organs are not active, the mind has gone to sleep. So we neither dream, and nor do we certainly ex experience anything in the world outside. Tat sushuptam, that is sushupti, deep sleep. Sushupti is the word for deep sleep. Jagrata, waking. Swapna, dream. Sushupti, deep sleep. So that is defined as deep sleep. What are its characteristics? Sushupta sthana eki bhutaha. There all is merged into one. Notice, in waking and dreaming, we have the difference of subject and object. Knower and known. I know you all. Waking. In dreams, I know things in my dream. But in deep sleep, there is no I and no object to be known. Why don't we say it's just a blank? Nothing. There is nothing there. No. Even that nothing is also experienced. When you wake up, when we wake up, we say we slept happily. I slept happily. I did not know anything. This I did not know anything. How did I know that? There must be some kind of basal experience there. Otherwise, you know what would happen? Suppose deep sleep was not there. There was no awareness at all in deep sleep. Suppose. Then what would happen is I would be awake. I would fall asleep. I would dream. And the next thing I would know is I'm awake. But we all have the intuition that when I was sleeping, there were some dreams and there were times of no dream. How do we know that? We would have no feeling at all about it. So there is a kind of deep recollection, not a memory recollection, because there is no individual experiencing something. So there's a, there are discussions about it. How is it recorded if the mind is not functioning at all? So, eki bhutaha, subject, object are merged in one. As if pragyana ghana, it's a mass of cognition. 
all of this is cognition, subject-object cognition. But if the cognitions were all mushed together, like a seed, when it sprouts, you can see the roots and the stem and the leaves and the branches and the fruits and flowers. But in the seed, it's all together. It's in a potential form. Deep sleep is the seed state. Everything is there. Oh, the same person, your annoying neighbor or roommate is still there. <laughs> but at that time, blank. It doesn't seem to be there. But when you wake up, oh, same annoying person comes back again. So all the details are still there, but all merged together. Pragyana ghanam. Anandamayaha. It's a blissful state because it's a state of rest. What does you what do you eat there? It's a figurative way of putting it. Ananda book. We experience bliss or rest, absence of any trouble at all. Cheto Mukaha, it is the source of waking and dreaming. Imagine waking state and dream state have disappeared into the deep sleep. And from that door it emerges again. From the deep sleep comes back wake uh, dreams, from the deep sleep comes back this waking. So it is the door of awareness, as it were. Cheto Mukaha. And we have a name there. Pragyaha. Our name in deep sleep is Pragya. We have been introduced to a range of Sanskrit terms. In waking, don't worry, you don't have to remember it. It's not like Tapavan Swami's class. You will not be turned away if you can't recite it all in the, in the next class. No. Uh, waking, our name is Vishwa. In dream, our name is Taijasa. And in deep sleep, our name is Pragya. But there is a cosmic, not just individual. God also has a kind of cause. We'll, we won't say that God is, has, is in deep sleep. A causal state. An unmanifest state. So that is called Ishwara. Ishwara. The causal state of God. Where consciousness exists with Maya. That is talked about in the sixth verse. Sixth mantra. Which we will read and stop. You can repeat if you want. Sixth mantra. Esha Sarveshwara. Esha Sarveshwara. Esha Sarvagyam. Esha Sarvagya, Esha Antaryami, Esha Antaryami, Esha Yoni Sarvasya, Esha Yoni Sarvasya, Prabhavapya Yohi Bhutanam, Prabhavapya Yohi Bhutanam, Esha Sarveshwara. Now you're talking about the cosmic aspect. Consciousness with the merged condition of all beings. Um, it is the Lord of all. Because it's associated with Maya. It is all knowing. Esha Sarvagya. So in deep sleep we do not know anything. And in that state God knows everything. That's the difference between us and God. Esha Sarvagya. Esha Antaryami. It is the inner controller of all beings. Yoni Sarvasya. It is the source of all beings. Prabhavapya Yohi Bhutanam. It is the source of the emergence and the disappearance of all beings. Just as our deep sleep is the source of our waking and dreams and the place where our dreams and waking disappear. Similarly, God's deep sleep, let's say, is the source where, from which the entire universe emerges and into which the entire universe disappears again. See, this is the idea of God in all the religions, the creator of the universe from which all beings emerge. Now, the way Manduke conceives it, it's like us, our deep sleep, waking and dreaming. What is the creation of the universe? It's like God waking up. What's the destruction of the universe? It's God taking a nap or going to, going to sleep. The entire universe disappears back into God again. So all this may sound strange and new. It is not. It's actually the Upanishad is actually trying to describe our waking, dreaming, deep sleep. To what end? We will see tomorrow. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat.